want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. As we finished up the Roman series, and uh, I wanted to take a minute and just, uh, I'm doing two things tonight, I'm trying to do a double duty, and one is I, I wanted to go back to one of the sections in Romans that is so important to me, and, uh, and just take a moment to review a little bit of that, and then in there also kind of help lead us further in as we prepare for a Coma My Sunday next week as well. And so if you look at Romans chapter 12, if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've heard me quote these verses, uh, because I, they're verses that have changed my life. Uh, I got saved when I was about 14 years old, but I wasn't living for the Lord. I wasn't in a church that taught me how to live for God. Uh, I didn't understand what it was. I, I joined the military, really running away from God and, and trying to find what I was looking for. And I, I didn't realize that where I would find it is not in the military or in a change of life, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so even though I was saved, I was not living for the Lord. And when I got in the military, I met some Christians for the first time who knew what they believed, why they believed it, and were really trying to live for the Lord. And, um, and I heard these verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Romans chapter 12, as you remember through our study, it's a transitional chapter. The first 11 chapters of the book that Paul was laying out, doctrinal foundation of salvation and, and uh, what Christ had done for us and explaining that to both the Jews and the, and the Gentiles. And then you get to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and you see the word therefore. And whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, find out what it's there for. Because it's always referring back. And I believe Romans chapter 12 is really, he says, okay, now I've, I've talked about salvation. I've talked about the love of God. I've talked about all of these things. And, and um, now, therefore, this is why you should give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And when we went through this in the book, uh, really, uh, one of the things you've got to challenge when you're going through a book Bible study is you want to be too long. But yet this was a chapter I, I, I really wish we could have spent more time on as well. And in, in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, and where did my notes go? My notes disappeared on me. Somebody took my notes. Can you bring me some copy of the notes from the, um, from the Welcome Center there, Tristan? Can you get those? But Romans chapter 12, and I, I don't know what happened my notes. They just disappeared. They were up here a, long, a while ago. But anyways, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Are, are introducing this chapter. And then if you look there, beginning with verse number three, down through verse number eight is where they are talking, where Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. And, and that's what we're doing on Wednesday night in our Bible study is we're going through a series talking about the Holy Spirit and specifically talking about the gifts of the Spirit in our life. And uh, every Christian, <coughs> as I mentioned morning, everybody, when they got saved, they received a gift or gifts of God. When you were born in your birth, you had your natural DNA, your, your natural the talents and abilities that God gave you and your personality. But when you got saved, God gave you a gift of the Spirit. And uh, many times he gives us even more than one gift. It might be the gift of mercy. It might be the gift of giving. It might be teaching. Uh, there's many gifts. And that's what we're going through on Wednesday night. We're taking one night to go through each gift. We're on, I think, this Wednesday night, the fourth gift. So if you want to go back and look at those passages, you can do that. And so he talks about the spiritual gifts. And there's so much there. I, I wish I could talk about tonight. But if you want to hear about that, you can come out on Wednesday night or follow us online on Wednesday night as well. And then he gets down to verse number nine. And basic verse 9 down through verse 16, he, he goes on to say that let love would be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectionate one to another. He's talking about our relationship one with another. And we have to have that humble, uh, sacrificial attitude and, and uh, giving to one another. And, uh, and, and, and like in verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them, rejoice and weep with them. The joy, re that we um, be of the same mind. Uh, so he's talking about our, our personal relationships. And uh, then he gets down to verse number 17. And in that section down to the end of the chapter, he talks about you know, uh, forgiving and, and not trying to recompense evil for evil, but recompense good, good for evil and, and realizing that as much as life in you, live peacefully with all men. 
And, and so all of these things are things that he's talking about in that passage there. And, and then, you know, so this passage, there's so much there. I would challenge you to go back and read through Romans chapter 12 and really t- uh, pay attention to what it's talking about there. But what I want to do today is I want to focus in, going back to the first two verses, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 and look at verse number 1. Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse number 1. Thank you, Tristan, you're a lifesaver. Appreciate that. Romans chapter 1 and, and verse number 1. And as you look at the passage here, Paul says this, a Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. And so Paul said, listen, I am a servant of Christ. And why is it? Because he gave himself as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is about being a servant of God, being a servant of God. So turn over to John chapter 13, John chapter 13, and look at verses 12 through 17. John chapter 13 and verses 12 through 17. John 13, verse 12, it says, So after he washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down, he again said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. And that last phrase there, the, he is saying, I am the, the great Jehovah, the great I am. I'm God. And then he goes on in verse number 14, he says, If I then, your Lord and Master, your God, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For if I, for I have given unto you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily I say unto you that the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He goes on from there. But basically he says, listen, you're to be servants one of another. Now, remember, we talked about this a little bit this morning also, is that in John chapter 13, they were having the, the Last Supper. Uh, this was made famous by a painting, and uh, all the disciples were gathered with Christ. And, and uh, when, when the tradition that day is like here in Hawaii, you take your shoes off when you come in the house. But beyond that also, because they wore sandals and the roads were all dusty and dirty, uh, they would always have a basin of water there at the entryway, and you, could, you would wash your feet before coming in the house. And if you were a, a, a good host or good hostess, you would have somebody there at the entry to wash your guest's feet when they came in as well. And it would usually be someone who was the, the lowest on the totem pole, like the youngest child or, or the lowest servant or whatever else it might be. And, and so that was a tradition of that day. And the disciples, one of them should have realized somebody's got to wash people's feet and should have volunteered for that, but none of them did. And so Jesus ended up washing their feet. And of course, Peter's reaction, no, Lord, you can't do that. And the Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, I have nothing to do with you. And, and he said, wash my whole body. And you know, Peter was a man of extremes. And God said, I don't need to wash your whole body because you're already cleansed. You're already washed. Such a great picture of salvation. In that when we get saved, God has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He has has forgiven us of all our sin. But when we, as Christians, do sin, we don't need to go back and get washed again. We just need to clean our feet, so to speak, or wash our hands. You know, I took a shower today, and and, uh, during the day, my hands get dirty, and I don't go back and take a shower just because my hands got dirty. I I go and wash my hands. And 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. So it's a wonderful picture in this passage. But what I want to focus on is verse number 17 of John chapter 13. It says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Do you want to be happy? I'll tell you the way you can be happy is do the Macarena. They say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, what are you talking about? This word happy comes from the same word we get that dance name from. And it means to be happy or blessed. Now, I'm not asking you to do a dance here in church. But what I am saying is that we need to understand that God says, if you want to truly be happy, then be a servant. Be a servant. And, and so what kind of servant are you going to be? There are four different kinds of servants in the Bible. Four different ones listed. And, and I want you to kind of evaluate, which of these am I? And, and the first servant in the Bible is a hired servant. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18, it's for the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The laborer or the servant is worthy of his hire. 
And so this is like an employee. You know, you, you're paid to do a job and, and you're serving in that position. Some of you are in service positions. You work as a waiter or you work in a store as a clerk or uh, serving people there or wherever it might be. But all of us are, are servants at work. We're a hired servant. No matter what you're being paid, you're being hired to do that job. And um, there's nothing wrong with being paid. And there's nothing wrong with being paid to serve the Lord. Uh, your staff here at Ohana, the pastoral staff, they're, they're paid to serve the Lord full time. And I can tell you that they earn every dollar of that pay and more. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with being paid to serve the Lord. The Bible talks about that. But, but whatever you do, you're serving God. In First Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11, this is for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Uh, God believes in hard work, and, and all of us should be busy working. And uh, I, I, when I first got my life going for the Lord, I, I got called in the ministry, and I was excited about that. But I wasn't ready to go to college yet, and so I was working a job. And I remember one time I said to my boss, who was unsaved, and I said, I can't wait until I'm serving the Lord full time. And, and this unsaved man looked at me and said, but aren't you serving the Lord now? And, and I realized that even in my secular job, I was still serving the Lord. And, and, and so wherever we're at, we should work hard and we should do our job. And, and the Bible says in Colossians 3.23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And if you go back and look at that verse, you'll find in context, he was talking to servants. And he says, servants, whatever job you have, whatever you're doing for a living, whatever you're being paid to do, you're not just serving that boss. You're not just serving that company. You're not just serving the government. You are serving the Lord. And, and so whenever, whatever you do, whether it's in the secular world or whether it's in a, in a church ministry, you need to remember that you are serving the Lord. Now, in a church ministry like this, most of our workers are volunteers, and they don't get paid. And that, that makes a challenge, because when you sign somebody's paycheck, you got a little more authority over them. But when they're volunteers, you can ask, but you can't always require it. And so I always tell the people that volunteer here at Ohana Baptist Church, I'm going to pay you double the military overtime pay. And so that way, they, they know that they're getting paid for what they're doing. But uh, the hired servant, though, often is in it for what they can get out of it. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 20 that Jesus told about this, that there was a man who had a field to harvest, and he went down uh, and uh, saw a bunch of people and out, out not doing anything. He said, listen, I'll, I'll hire you to come work for me. And what he offered him was he offered him a penny. Now, that doesn't sound like much to us, but back in that day, a penny was a day's wage. And, and right now, uh, a day's wage on the average for the average person was about $200. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll offer the same thing. So uh, would anybody like a penny? Uh, I've got a penny to give out. You want a penny? Okay, here you go. All right, there you are. And JD, would you like, like to have $200 since that's the equivalent to a day's wage? Absolutely. Then go get a job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway... The, the penny was a day's wage. So these guys early in the morning went out and found these guys said, come over to my field and I'll, I'll pay you a day's wage. And then he, he realized that there wasn't enough people working. So went back out a couple hours later, found some more guys and said, come and work in my field. I'll pay you what's fair. And that's, they still didn't have enough. He went out again and he, and he went out again late in the afternoon for, and hired some people to just come out and work for about an hour. And then after they were all done working, he called them to get their pay. And, the, and he started with the guys that were hired to last that worked just one hour. And he gave them a penny. He gave them a day's wage. And, and all the other guys are thinking, man, if they only worked an hour and they're getting a penny, what's he going to give me for working all day long? And when he got down to the first guys, he gave them the same amount. He gave them a penny. And, and they started grumbling and complaining. He said, this isn't fair. And by the way, you need to learn real quick that life is not always fair. But this isn't fair. We worked in the field all day long. They worked for an hour. We got paid the same amount. And, and the master said, listen, we made an agreement. And I've kept my end of the agreement. And, and the point, there's a lot of lessons we can learn out of here. But there's the one I, I want you to remember. And that is this. When you demand a contract of God, you get what you ask for. In Matthew 20, they said, well, we'll work for a penny. They negotiate with the master and said, we'll work for a penny. And, and that's what they got. And a lot of Christians are that way. Well, God, I'll tithe if you make me wealthy. 
God, I'll live for you as long as I'm happy. I'll serve you if you take care of all my problems. And when we negotiate with God, what happens is we get what we ask for. But you know what? You need to realize that God is a lot more generous than we can even ask for. When we first came back to Hawaii in 1986 to start the church, we didn't have enough support uh, to, to live and do the church at the same time. So I had to work part time. And I worked at, down at Waikiki. I managed one of the apartment buildings down there. If you've ever been to Waikiki at the far end, there's a fountain. And there's a building in front of that fountain called the Diamond Head Ambassador. And it's, a, it was a, it's kind of an older building now. There's two of them. But back then, it was a very uh, wealthy section of town. And, and uh, I would come in during the day and manage the place. And there's a lot of wealthy people that uh, owned uh, apartments there. And, and, uh, and a lot of them didn't know how to do things for themselves. And so what they would do is they would come to me and say, listen, do you know an electrician and come and fix my light switch? Or do you know somebody come fix my toilet's running and I want to get it fixed? And, and can you call a plumber? And, I, I, and I'd say to them, well, you know, uh, I, I think I can fix that. Uh, I was pretty handy with my hands. I said, I'll come in after work and take care of that for you. Because it wasn't part of my job description. That was their apartment. But uh, I offered to come in afterwards to work for them. So I, I'd replace a light switch. A very simple job if you know what you're doing. Or I'd go in the toilet and fix the runny toilet. And it wasn't hard to do. And, and uh, it would be done in an hour or less. And, and when it was all done, they would ask me, well, how much do you want for it? Now, in my mind, and remember this is back in 1986. In my mind, I was thinking, you give me 10 bucks, I'll be happy. But instead of saying that, I just said to them, whatever you think is fair. And these guys would hand me $50 or $100. And I thought, I'm never going to ask for anything from these guys. I'm just going to let them get what they want. Because they always gave me more than I would have asked for. And that's the kind of God we serve. Is God will give you more than you can even imagine to ask for it if you'll let him. But so often what we do is we kind of negotiate with God and say, God, I'll live for you if you'll give me this. And God says, okay, but you're shortchanging yourself. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken down and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. See, if you try to bargain with God, you'll always lose. Because God is much more generous than you can even imagine. The hired servant, they're in it for what they can get out of it. And the hired servant also, um, so often is, is the, they're, they're negotiating a contract. Now, there's one contract you need to negotiate with God. In Isaiah chapter, chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You need to make sure you've got the contract of salvation. And that contract is not a negotiation, God, if I do all these things, because you and I, we have nothing to offer to God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest a man should boast. A lot of people come to God and say, God, if you'll, give, if you'll let me go to heaven when I die, I'll be a good person, and I'll go to church, and I'll get baptized, and I'll get catechized, and all the rest of these things. And God says, no, that's not the negotiation we're talking about. See, he, he has an offer to make to you. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says, But God commendeth or showed his love towards us, in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God offers us more than we deserve. You and I, what we deserve is we deserve hell. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. And you and I, if we are going to negotiate with God to get what we deserve, then we are going to end up in hell for eternity. But if we come to God and say, God, I need salvation. See, God wants to make you an offer that you cannot refuse. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You need to receive. You need to sign that contract with Jesus Christ. You need to trust him as your Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and you can't negotiate your salvation with God in the sense that, that you can offer him anything because you have nothing to offer. But he offers you everything, and he offers you salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. 
See, the problem is, so often when we are this kind of servant, the, the servant that's there to serve for what they can get out of it, is, is so often we demand more. You know, in Matthew chapter 20, when those other people started getting paid all this money for working less hours, the other ones were giving them a stink eye, you know. Why can you get so much when you didn't work as hard as I did? And, and sometimes as, as Christians, we're more concerned about what our neighbor gets than what we get. We're more concerned about, we're worried about everybody else. In John chapter 21, um, John, uh, Peter, when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And, and, and Peter was struggling because of his rejection of God for, when he was crucified. But, but then he said, well, what about John? When, when Jesus told him, you're going you're gonna to suffer and die for me. When he said, well, what about this guy over here? We're all so concerned about the other person. And that's the employee, the, the laborer type servant, the employee type servant. It's about what can I get out of this? You know, they're getting paid more than me, or, and I work harder than them, or they're getting recognized, and, and I'm not. And, and we're concerned about what we're going to get out of it. You know, I found that the best workers don't need recognition, and the worst workers need the most recognition. You know, the best workers, you don't have to ever say a word. They're just glad to serve God, and they don't have to be recognized. But sometimes the other people, there's people that if you don't keep saying, hey, thank you for what you're doing, and, and point it out to everybody, they, they don't keep serving the Lord. What are you in it for? You see, often these kind of workers, the labor workers, the employee-type workers, they're comparing themselves. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And so often we're looking around and say, well, I, does more, I do more than he does. And, and uh, why didn't they ask me to do this? And, and why is it? And we're always concerned about getting that recognition. And it ends up not being a work of love. In Revelation chapter 2, he commended the church there and he says, you guys uh, work hard, but you need to do it out of love. Somebody once said, you choose a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. You know, that's the way it ought to be as serving the Lord, is that we're not working, we're serving God. And don't wait to be asked. In Matthew chapter 20 with those workers, he had to go looking for them. And we should be looking to serve the Lord. They were standing around idle doing nothing. And as a Christian, we should never be that way. We should always be ready what, what needs to be done. Next week for Acoma My Sunday, I hope every one of you can be looking around and say, how can I help? What can I do? See, these kind of servants are available to the highest bidder. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, it says, No servant can serve two masters. For either you hate the one and love the other, or else you hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And that's so often what happens is, is we're looking for the, where we can get what we want more than what we can do for the Lord. And so you got the, 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 the servant that's the laborer servant, the one that is there for what he can get out of it, and he's the one that's uh, the hired servant. Then the second kind of servant you have is a, a subordinate or an assistant. Uh, I, I compare this to like being the E1. This is a servant that does what he's told to do, and that's all. You know, if the average Christian gave as much effort to their job as they do to their ministry, they'd be fired unless they work for the government. And, um, you know, this kind of servant is, is just there. If I'm told to do something, I'll do it. But then they just stop there and don't do anything else. This kind of servant, look in Matthew chapter 8 in verses 8 and 9. Matthew chapter 8. In verses 8 and 9, it says, The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he, do, he, do, he does it. You know, so this is the kind of servant that will do what they're asked to do, but that's all. They never, they never really look for something to do, and they don't do more than they're asked to do. In Luke chapter 11, verse 42, it says, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to do, have done and not to leave the other undone. And so often this, this, this servant that has this attitude is, is they're, they're just going to do what they have to do to get by rather than what they can do for the Lord. 
In, in Luke chapter 17, turn over there if you would. Luke chapter 17. And look at verses 7 through 10. Luke chapter 17 and verses 7 through 10. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat? It will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird my, thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I, I trow not, or I think not. So likewise ye, when you, you shall have done all these things which I commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. See, the unprofitable servant is the one who's just done what he was supposed to do. You know, if you're, if you're coming to church, praise God. But there's a lot more to church than just showing up and sitting in the pew. If you every once in a while will help out in one of the ministries here and there, that's, that's a blessing. But we need Christians who are going to go above and beyond the call of duty. They're not going to say, what do I have to do, but what do I get to do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 5, it says, And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Look at verse 7. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith, and in utterance, and knowledge, in all diligence, your love to, to us, see that you abound in this grace also. See, the, this kind of servant is one that just does what he has to do, but the right kind of servant says, man, I, I, get to, I get to serve the Lord. I don't have to serve God. I get to serve God. The unprofitable service is the one that looks looks for what they can get by with on the minimum rather than the maximum. Well, I read my Bible today. I did my duty, but I didn't read it with a love for God and a desire to learn. You see, the, the servant needs to go beyond that. And this kind of servant will serve until there's a problem. There's a young man named John Mark that went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey to be kind of a gopher for them. And then he got homesick, and he, he didn't like what he's being told to do, and he, he, he went back home again. He quit. And this kind of servant is the one that just doesn't, doesn't stay faithful. He just quits easily. But the next kind of servant is a ministry servant. In Acts chapter 6, they, they were to choose deacons from among them. And the word deacon is, is simply another word for slavery. It means servant. It means to be a slave. See, deacons aren't people that are up there telling everybody what to do. Their people are being told what to do. They're, they're the servants of the church. And God wants us to be ministry servants. He wants us to serve others. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the statement because I've said it in the past and I've gotten in trouble for it because people misunderstood it. And here's the statement. We serve ourselves by serving God and others. If you are concerned about you, then the best way to serve yourself is to put God first, others second, and yourself last. You serve yourself by serving God and others. The best way to be selfish is to be selfless. The best way to be selfish is to be selfless by giving of yourself. In Matthew chapter 20, turn back over there again if you would, Matthew chapter 20. And beginning with verse number 26, Matthew chapter 20, and beginning with verse number 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, we need to be selfless if we want to be selfish. It's, it's giving of ourselves and, and serving God and serving others. You know, it's interesting, when you read this passage in the context, you ever read the context of this verse? Right before this, Jesus had just finished telling his disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to die. And you know what their response was? Who gets to rule with you? You know, it's, it's kind of like I've told the story before. It's kind of like when my kids were younger, 
we, we'd got an insurance policy, and I had to have the medical exam for the policy, and so the guy came down, took my blood and all the rest of the stuff, make sure I wasn't going to die the next day, and, and the kids asked mom, well, what, what was he doing here? And she explained to him, well, we're getting an insurance policy for dad. And, and well, what's an insurance policy? Well, if he dies, we get money. And they said, well, how much money do we get? And I, I don't remember for sure. It was $100,000, $200,000, something like that. Uh, maybe four hundred. I can't remember what it was. But uh, uh, we get this money. And, and their eyes got really big. And they said, that much money? And mom said, yeah. And then they began talking among themselves, saying, you know, with that much money, we could buy a horse. Or we could go buy a pool. Or we could go do this and go, we could go to Disneyland. And my wife looks at him and says, you realize to get that money, dad has to die. Oh. But can we still go to Disneyland? <laughs> you know, that kind of response didn't, I, I kept my eyes open for the next few days, making sure I wasn't being put off by my, killed, killed by my kids. But the point is, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And what do they start talking about? Who gets to be on your right hand? Who gets to be the big shot? You see, we're focused on the wrong things. We're serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible concept that Jesus was trying to get across in John chapter 13 is servant leadership. In Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, because what? He became our servant. He not only died upon the cross for us, but he came to serve the very people he had created. And Jesus said, if I, your Lord, your master, your God, have washed your feet, what should you do to one another? And God wants us to be servants, ministering servants, and master followers to follow Christ in his example. But there's one other kind of servant, and that's the one that Paul talked about, Romans chapter 1. I, the servant of Jesus Christ. And the word there in the Greek, it means to be a bond slave. A bond slave. Now, the bond slave took the master. When a bond slave, he was someone who that, when he was offered his freedom... Because a lot of slaves in that day, many of them were captured in battle and other situations, but many of them were in slavery because of debt that they owed. And, and so sometimes they were able to work that debt off, and you'd have to be a slave for seven years, and then you'd be set free. And so the day would come that the master would come to that slave and said, I'm going to free you now. You're, you're free. You can, you can leave. And, and the slave says, you know what? I don't want to leave. You've treated me well. I, I love you. I love your family. I love serving here. I don't want to leave. And then they would become a bond slave. And a bond slave was someone who had the opportunity for freedom, but chose instead to remain a slave. The bond slave was one that took the master's name. They no longer had their own name. Now they were known by the master's name. You know what it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26? And they were called Christians. They took the name of Christ. They would have a public ceremony where they would take them down to the, to the courtyard of the town, and they would go up and they'd have a post there. And they'd take them up to the post, and they would put their ear up against the post, and they would take an awl and, and pierce their ear. You thought pierced ears were something pretty recent. They were way back, way back then. And then they would put an earring on. I got one of my wife's earrings here. She doesn't have pierced ears, but she has those pinched ones. And, oh, they hurt. Um, you know, I'm glad I'm not a lady. I, I know there's a lot of guys that wear earrings now, and more power to them. But listen, I, I'm glad I'm not a lady because I don't have to wear high heels. I don't have to wear earrings. I don't have to have the babies. All those are good reasons why I'm glad I'm a man. And this is another good reason why. But imagine, here's this guy, walks into town, and everybody sees him, and there's an earring in one ear. Everybody knows he could have been free. He could have had his own life back. He could have left the master, and he chose not to. A lot of slaves had no choice in the matter, but this guy did. 
And I'm sure a lot of people judged him and say, man, if I could have been free, I'd have, I'd have chosen it right away. And I'm sure a lot of, but you know, the point is, he wasn't ashamed. He was known throughout the town of being the guy that had the earring that had chosen to be a slave. First Peter chapter two, and I'm taking this off, this hurts. First Peter chapter two, verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Everyone in this room has a choice to serve God or not. God's not going to force you. Now, you can do it for what's in it for you. You can do it for the recognition and do just the minimum that's required. You can even do it as a ministering servant to say, okay, this is what I'm called to do, then I'm going to do that. But the greatest calling of God is to be a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In verses 16 through 19. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves as servants to obey, his servants ye are. To whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the service of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which delivered you. You got saved. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and unto iniquity, even so now yields your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. See, God wants us to yield. Not to serve because of what we're going to get out of it. Not to do just what we have to do to get by. And even serving as ministers, as service of the Lord is good. But ultimately, He wants us to yield our lives to Him. And say, God, I love you because you've loved me. And I give myself as a living sacrifice unto you. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the service of corruption. For who a man is overcome of the same is he brought to bondage. And when you are overcome with the love of God, you just say, God, I want to serve you with all my heart and with everything I have. And so I want to challenge you tonight. What kind of servant are you? There's a lot of great doctrine in the book of Romans, and I'm thankful for all we learned in the process of it. But the pivotal point of Romans is Romans chapter 12. He says, now that you understand all of what God has done for you in sending his son to die for you, what are you going to do? He's not going to force you to be a servant. And you can negotiate with him all you want. But ultimately, will you give yourself as a bond slave of Jesus Christ? A turning point in my life was a 14-year-old boy when I bowed my head in my heart and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. The second turning point in my life when I was about 18 years old in the military. And I realized that God wanted, not, not, wanted to be not just my Savior, but my Lord. And on that day, I bowed my head in my heart and said, Lord, I give myself to you. Now, I've not always been perfect at that, and I've failed in many ways, but I've never regretted that decision, and that decision has guided my life for 40 years. Have you made that decision of what kind of servant you're going to be of God? You first got to make sure of your salvation, but then you just decide, am I going to serve him? for the right reasons. Am I going to be a bond slave of Jesus Christ?